Welcome to the Carveline Tech Service Podcast, the go-to industrial coatings podcast. Here are your hosts, Jack Walker and Paula Jamis. Be sure to hit like, subscribe, and set your notifications to on so you never miss any important YouTube content from Carveline. All right, here we are again on the Carveline Tech Service Podcast. I'm Jack Walker, and we got a little new thing going on this week. Uh, we're going to do video. And so you may be listening to this on your normal stream, but uh, we also will have this thing up on YouTube. So, uh, Paul, how's it going, man? It's going pretty well, Jack. So like you said, we're doing video, so it's a little odd looking at myself as we're talking the, our way through this, but I'll get past it. Yeah, you're not the only one who's going to have to work at looking at you while we do this thing, too. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've been told I have a great face for radio, so I guess we're messing that up. That makes both of us. But uh, <laughs> way back when, when we started the Carveline Tech Service podcast, we had one William Sewell or Bill Sewell on. He kind of morphed into a later episode into Bill. Um, and if you're watching yep. this thing, you see him at the bottom of the screen. So, hey, Bill, how's it going? Going pretty well, man. Going pretty well. Wor working hard. Looking at you guys, you know, Paul, Paul also hired me for my phone prowess and not my, uh, not my beautiful face, but I think we'll make it, you know, hopefully we don't run all your listeners off. That's right. <laughs> well, now we have viewers. Yeah, viewers. Oh, yeah. That's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, well, you're going to thin the herd, you know, only the dedicated fans are going to stick around after this. That's, so. that's, that's right. Uh, so one of the things uh, we did, if you've been listening to the show, we've done a couple episodes where we've talked about, uh, the different coding uh, defects that could happen and their similarities and their differences. So uh, we thought it'd be a good idea to bring Bill on, who's got uh, some really good field experience in inspection. Besides his field inspection, before he moved into the field, he was the guy who did the failure analysis for us at the lab in uh, R&D. So Bill has spent a majority of his time at, in the coatings industry dealing with this exact subject. So we thought he'd be a great person to have on. So I think we should just get right into it. So one of the things we talked about in the first episode is we talked about how um, bubbles and blisters are very similar, yet they're very different. So Bill, why don't you kind of take a stab when you get to a job site and you're looking at the uh, bubble or, or blister and you're trying to determine which one it is, uh, the process that you go through in order to make that determination. Yeah, sure. For, first of all, back up though, you know, I used to work in the lab and now you're saying that I realize I'm in the field now. What, what happened, man? I had a nice cushy lab <laughs> job and now I find myself walking around these sites. I think, uh, I think Paul got the best of me, you know? Yeah, you know, we, we take what we can get and uh, you gave, so. <laughs> yeah, there we go, yeah. <laughs> Anyway, we'll discuss my career later, but back, back to bubbles and blisters. Um, yeah, so at first glance, these two phenomena can look very similar. You have some kind of, I almost hate to use the word bubble because it's one of the, one of the categories, but a bubble-like phenomenon sitting on the surface, a, a convex surface defect sitting on top of the film, right? You look at them, they look similar. They look a little bit different, but it's not, it's not totally a tangible thing. Experience over time will kind of tell you which is which, but sort of the main differentiating factor is that blisters tend to go down to the primer or to the substrate, whereas bubbles are confined to that, to that top layer. Bubbles are usually related to application, maybe moisture in a urethane, maybe oil got into the spray air, applying some other kind of top coat. Urethanes are really bad, but alkyds and acrylics can do it as well. Um, whereas blisters tend to be more related to either A, chemical attack in like a tank linings type scenario, or B, underfilm corrosion, and that can happen either in a tank lining scenario or an atmospheric scenario where you've got like an active corrosion cell working underneath the film, causing that blistering. So really, the first thing you should do to differentiate the two is pop a couple of blisters and see how far down they go. If they go to metal or they go to the, the primer, maybe a zinc primer or some other type, you probably have some kind of chemical attack or some kind of corrosion cell at work under the film. If it's confined to the top coat, you likely have an application-related bubbling scenario you think that's fair paul is that a fair characterization yeah yeah it really is it's a great way to to approach the scenario when you're when you're trying to figure out what's going on um you know and one of the things that that kind of leads you leads us straight into is as we move from from bubbles and blisters kind of into the pinholes the craters um that kind of a of a defect because in a lot of cases 
a crater could have started as a as a blister or a bubble. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you kind of see as you walk into a job site and you're seeing a lot of of for right now, let's call them craters um, yeah. as far as what you're looking at. Yeah. So if you if you walk in and we see generic surface defects, we'll say that we don't know if they originate as blisters or craters or whatever. You see these surface defects, right? The first thing I want to ask myself is, you know, how long ago did this happen? Because because blisters tend to pop over time, especially in scenarios where you're like maybe draining the liquid out of a tank. Those definitely tend to pop. But let's look around and see if we can find an intact blister. If we see one blister or a few blisters and a lot of holes in the film, those were probably blisters at one point. But if we're seeing just pure cratering and no, you know, one blister will likely survive. But if we see no actual surviving blisters, we might be dealing with a cratering type scenario, which, as you guys have covered before, is application technique related. Some kind of contaminant got into the film during application as opposed to blistering you know, blistering phenomena are more chemical related, whether that be on the substrate or from some form of chemical attack. And I think that's really the differentiating factor between the two classes is one is purely application technique and cleanliness related. The other is some sort of chemical phenomenon acting on the film. Yeah, I think that's one of the things that we uh, really talked about is how uh, even bubbling comes from the same uh, place as the pinholing or cratering. It's usually... Yes solvent entrapment it's uh some kind of uh thing that happens during application where blisters you know this is something that you're dealing with before uh, the inspector is signed off on the job when you're looking at uh blistering it's usually something where you're coming in for a uh inspection after a certain amount of time has passed and then you're you're finding that blister absolutely so so I guess to the other thing that we've kind of talked about over the last couple of weeks is we looked at that whole phenomenon of the different types of, of overarching term cracking. So whether it be a mud cracking or an alligatoring or something like that, it seems like that should be, that's probably something you see a lot, especially as you go out and you do these surveys and you're doing large scale inspections coming across a lot of areas with, with those types of, of defects. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what you see, how you pick between which words you're going to use when you do it and how you identify them when you're, when you're doing those inspections. Yeah, sure. So the line between cracking, mud cracking, checking and alligatoring can be a little bit of a fuzzy line. Mm -hmm. If you ask five different inspectors, you know, is this alligatoring, is this checking? There may be some disagreement, but, he, but here's the overarching principle. All of those kinds of defects are drying phenomenon related. So the rate at which solvent is leaving the film and the rate at which the film is chemically curing are, are different enough to where solvent has usually left that film too quickly before the film developed enough structural integrity to hold itself together cohesively. And when I say cohesively, I mean, you know, in, in this dimension here where the film tries to hold itself together, but the solvent left too quickly and there wasn't enough strength, so it broke apart. This is really bad in inorganic zincs. Whenever you see an inorganic zincs down to the substrate, I'm calling that mud cracking every time. That's just sort of a convention. Zincs are known to mud crack, right? Um, yeah. You see it less severe and maybe a, um, a lighter filled coating, like uh, just say a urethane or an epoxy, it doesn't really matter. Not, as, not in the inorganic zinc. Um, if you're seeing a little bit of it not down to substrate, I'm probably calling that checking. If it's severe down to substrate, I'm calling it cracking. Or all, all, alligatoring is sort of, somewhere in between and alligatoring tends to happen in patterns. It's not as random. It'll be like unidirectional cracking, if that makes any sense. Yeah, it really and, does. And, and that is where that term, you know, it looks like the skin of an alligator. It's in right. big, long, long cracks that are running parallel to each other frequently. Right. Yeah. And I think uh, one of the big things too is uh, the location of that crack. I mean, if you're on a weld or, or, or something like that, it, it's pretty obvious that there's some kind of flex going on and uh, causing that coating to crack, um, where I think the mud cracking, the alligating, those kinds of things are definitely a result of the curing, whereas uh, the stress cracking definitely comes from a different form. Yeah, definitely. One, one is physical um, cracking, so to speak, is, is a physical thing. And um, 
whereas mud cracking, I guess you could say it's physical as well. We have a solvent leaving the film and the cure rate of the film. So that's sort of those two things need to interplay in the right way to produce mud cracking. Inorganic zincs, several things could lead to it. Not enough moisture for the zinc to cure fast enough while solvent still leaving, keep that in mind. That can lead to it. Temperature, using a solvent that's too fast, anything that messes up that balance of rates of solvent leaving the film and the film curing is gonna tend to lead to mud cracking. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I, I kind of wanted to talk about too is so you, you get to a job site and, and you're trying to determine, you know, the, the cause of any one of these given failures. Um, how important is it whether that is localized or across the entire structure? It's very important. And it also addresses how you're going to fix it. So like you, Jack, a minute ago talked about welds, you know, let's say a job is, 95% good and we have cracks on the welds, right? Well, in that case, I'm probably having people blast the welds, use the prepare or the repair procedure according to the manufacturer and just tie that into the existing coating. You know, maybe if you want to convince yourself everything's all right, do an adhesion test on the good coating. If it's good, let's just fix the welds. Let's stripe coat the welds and do a proper repair. If it's everywhere, it's all going to need to be blasted off, unfortunately. And there, there's something structurally wrong with the way the job was done. Maybe the wrong thinner, maybe the conditions weren't right, maybe it was too hot, something like that. Even miscatalization can happen, you know, can lead to that, you know, the wrong ratio of A to B. Yep. I think uh, one of the things that's important to think about because, I mean, I've been there, I've been on site. One of the first things that people want to jump to when any one of these things happen is uh, the paint's no good. That's something that we hear, right? The paint's no good. And while that sometimes, like, like for real, sometimes that's a problem. Like we can't, yeah, you know, yeah. even as a coating manufacturer, we do have to admit time to time that that's a legit thing, but more often than not, it's deeper than that. That, that is a very easy uh, explanation, especially when uh, you have a very localized uh, problem. If you have one bucket of paint that covered, you know, 500 square feet and you have a five square foot problem <laughs> kind of eliminates the paint immediately. It's not the paint. Right. Yeah. Right. Yep. I, I'll say this, it, it, you know, I, I'm trained as a chemist. I'm, I'm not a product development chemist, but I'm, I know a good bit about these things. Paul, you have a chemistry background as well. And, and if you, if you told me to develop a coating that looked good in the bucket, applied well, you know, good fan pattern looked good and all that but then cracked consistently every time after you applied it or mud cracked or blistered, it'd be a tough paint to design. I don't think I could do that. So it's like whenever there's something wrong with the paint, it will usually be apparent when you open the bucket or when you start to apply it, you know, you won't get a good fan. It's just not going to work. You're going to notice before that paint gets on the substrate and starts curing. Everything didn't go great. And then all of a sudden the paint failed. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's never going to go perfect. And then all of a sudden it just, oh, wow, the, the way they manufactured this lot, it, it, it blisters. It's it, not saying it's impossible, but those are very low probability events. Right. Right. Well, I'll take it one step further. You said that would be a hard paint to formulate your manufacturer. That'd be an impossible paint to sell. Like who's going to buy that? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, I if, if it's a faux finisher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, what this called the, uh, what the the weathered finish people pay good money for that you know that's right yeah. the crackle yeah. what is the it the, the acid washed blue jeans that people yep. go after these days you know that yeah. that was uh that's a throwback to paul's and i's uh youth yeah. that that's yeah. uh i finally hit that stage where i'm old enough to see the fashion from my teenage years come back around <laughs> and, and it wasn't good then I mean, the first part, you know, they don't tight roll their pants now because they don't have to because of skinny jeans. But right. uh, that's a whole other thing. So but wait, Jack, like, are, are you are you doing kids these days talks now? How old are you now? Man? Oh, yeah. No, let's not go there. But it does feel that <laughs> way. That was my little crankety old man soapbox. But one of the things that uh, we kind of talked about before we got on here that I thought was kind of interesting, and uh, this is probably uh, going to get us close to the end, but you talked about with blisters and opening up a tank, 
and whether or not they were localized or uniform across the whole uh, inside of a tank, storage tank, yeah. and what that kind of uh, indicated. I thought that that's a very important thing to hit on. Yeah, and, and really in failure analysis in general, you know, are, are we dealing with an isolated thing, which is likely technique related, or are we dealing with something that's over the whole or majority of the job site? Um, giving a great example would be having a tank lining where from the liquid line down is 100% blistered, and then above the liquid line, no blisters. What does that tell you? What, what, what variable changed there? Well, yeah. everything immersed blistered. So what does that say? That says that the lining likely wasn't compatible with the immersion service, you know? Um, another case, maybe we have a tank that holds uh, a vapor or maybe something that's um, – <laughs> A coating that's in a, a high heat service and it's totally 100% blistered. Well, probably wasn't the right coating for the job, you know. In, in that sense, you could say it is the paint, but not as manufactured. The paint as designed is the wrong choice for the job there. Yep. Acrylics are great, they make really poor under insulation 700 degree coatings, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Yeah, and, and I think that's a good place to stop. You know, if we if yeah. we talk about it and we think about it, um, it's very important to have somebody like Bill when it comes time to uh, evaluate what is going on. Uh, we learned from Blaine in an earlier episode that it's a uh, third-party inspection is, is great as well. Um, but these are the guys that are going to help you figure out what went wrong. Um and like we said in the previous episode, and we said earlier, a lot of these uh, types of deform, uh, you know, the the bubbling, the pinholing, the cratering, the uh, alligatoring, those kinds of things usually show up in the application portion of the job. The job hasn't been finished yet. Um, where you see blisters coming in later, you see uh, some of the stress cracking coming in later, The uh, even the mud cracking happens during the application portion of the job. So these things are all indicators as to what the original cause of the uh, pro problem was. It doesn't matter if we call it what we call it at the end of the day. It's It's about figuring out what the root cause was so that we can move on and have a, uh, a good finished product at the end of it. So uh, Bill, thank you very much for uh, joining us and being our guinea pig for the first video <laughs> Carboline tech service podcast. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's always been my life goal to be a recurring character on a paint podcast. So thank you once again for allowing that dream to come true. Yeah, Check we don't off. Yeah, we don't have Beetlejuice, but we have Billum. So that's right. Uh, <laughs> hey man, yeah. Second best is uh is better than last. Where where's the ring? The ring? Yeah. You know, you're precious. Oh. <laughs> I lost it. That's what's wrong with you, man. <laughs> that is what's wrong with you. So you better find those uh those uh you know short people and get it back. But uh for Paul over here and uh, uh Bill, I'm Jack, and we'll see you guys next week. Thanks again.